I've heard a lot of people say it's been a weird winter. Uh, the monsoons are here. You guys are on the western slope. Has it been any different? Has it been warm like it has been over here? Okay. Well, um, it's been a weird winter, right, so far? I guess people say that. we not realizing it's not technically winter yet. Um, so don't worry. You're about to get some winter temperatures coming up here in the next week or so. Uh, you know what I've learned about human nature? It's never happy no matter what. If it's warm in the winter, it's like, oh, man, I just wish we get snow. You get snow, we just need a break from the snow, you know? It's just so hard to drive in. So just thank God you're alive, amen? Thank God you're saved. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm uh, going to get through uh, the, we're getting towards really the end of the chapter. It's a sort of the, the closing final thoughts that Paul has. And like any good preacher, he lets them think that's the last time he's going to write them. Then he writes them a second one, amen? Just like a message, you're like, I'm almost done. And about 30 minutes later, it's on point number four out of seven, something like that. So uh, we're, we're going to the end of the chapter, and basically what you got uh, is final thoughts and blessings to the Thessalonians. Final thoughts and blessings to the Thessalonians. And we talked, uh, we ended up last week uh, leaving off with a thought about sanctification. All right? Uh, I want you to look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There was some great instruction we looked at. Let's go through it again real quickly. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. That's good. All right, pray without ceasing, that's good stuff. In everything give thanks, all right? And I think that's something that you do, not just on the third Thursday of November, amen? Uh, that's something you ought to be doing every single day. In everything give thanks. Now, I, I've, I've oftentimes heard preachers say, and I've, I've been guilty of this, I, I would point out here, this is in everything, not for everything. The problem is in Ephesians, it says for everything give thanks. And so, you know, the unexpected bill, Give thanks. Amen. Someone steals a couple thousand dollars from your bank account, give thanks. <laughs> right? Uh, the, 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 the truth is, you can, if you learn to do that, you would realize there's a, there's a whole other dimension of the Christian life that some of you have never experienced. And it's because you're a Christian as long as things go your way. And when they don't go your way, then you're frustrated and mad at God. There's, just, there's no joy in that. There's no lasting peace in that. And I, I want to challenge you this morning with that thought, in everything give thanks, for everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you want to know the will of God for your life, learn to be thankful. Learn to be thankful. I, I, I would challenge you with this thought. Uh, how much of your conversation this last week, let's, let's, no, let's, let's not do that. How much of your conversation this morning? You know, you come into church, you got the Bible. Um, stands like a rock undaunted me. Got my King James Bible ready to go, preacher. Everything's perfect in my life. Listen, uh, I, you're not fooling anybody. All right, you wake up. Oh, I don't want to wake up. Oh, the coffee's cold. Listen, think about t just today. How much complaining has gone on versus how much Thanksgiving's gone on? All right, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You will never know God. And you'll never know the will of God for your life as closely as you could if you don't learn to be thankful, all right? Quench not the Spirit. We talked about that. Grieving the Spirit of God, as it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And we looked at this in great detail last week. You cannot lose the Spirit of God. Can I get an amen in that? Amen. If you're saved, you can't lose Him. Thank God for that. But boy, you can grieve Him and you can quench Him. I've been in certain situations, and I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, a, a holiday party at work or whatever, and we go, we eat the food, we get the gift, and we head out. You say, why? If you stay too long, it's pretty grieving to the Spirit of God inside of you. You know exactly what I'm talking about. All right? They start drinking more and more, and they start laughing. It's, just, it's obnoxious, and it's like, I don't belong, I don't fit here. All right? Uh, you say, what is that? That's quenching the Spirit of God. It's basically a matter of disobeying what God says. And when you disobey the leading of the Spirit of God in your life, while He'll never leave you, thank God for that, you can quench Him and you can grieve Him. And uh, the whole goal in the Christian life is to learn to, to do what John the Baptist, you know what John the Baptist said? He said, and that's the last time a Baptist ever said it, amen? I'm just kidding, all right? He, he said, he said uh, uh, I must decrease, he must increase. And when there's more of you, there's less room for him. It's not that he leaves you, but boy, there's just less of, uh, of him filling you. Uh, that's why uh, over there, uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, be filled with the Spirit of God. Um, I, 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 I won't want to get too far off on a tangent here, but uh, 
Mm, go to uh, Luke real quickly. Christmas story stuff. Go to Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter one. And let's see if I can. Uh, oh, that's chapter two. That's why. Uh, Luke chapter one. And what I'm looking for. Let me see if I can find it. It's uh, talking about John the Baptist before he's born. And it talks about him being filled with the Spirit and that he would not drink strong drink. Um, verse 15. All right, look at verse uh, Luke 1, 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Let me tell you something. If God can say you're great in his eyes, that's a big deal. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Now, I know some of you are like, well, if I don't drink in, you know, if I drink in moderation, it's okay. And, um, you know, it's not a big deal. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. And let me just show you that uh, John the Baptist was great in the eyes of God. I don't think he was great simply because he was a teetotaler, okay? Uh, but I will tell you uh, that God filled him with the Spirit of God. And I believe one of the reasons he did is because he didn't put the wrong stuff in. Uh, there's only so much room for God to work. You understand that, right? You're in a, you're in a limited capacity because of your flesh. And if you give too much room for the flesh to operate, the Spirit of God doesn't have room to work. Uh, look at uh, uh, Ephesians 5 and look at verse 18. And be not drunk with wine. Now here's what people say. Well, see, you, you can't be drunk. Well, hold on. Read the rest of the verse. Wherein is excess. Grammatically speaking, the word uh, uh, excess all right, goes back to the word wine. It doesn't go back to drunk. That doesn't even grammatically make sense. The excess exists in the wine itself before you ever take a drink of it. That's the point. And so I know some of you are like, I don't know about this. Well, I'm going to go home and study a little bit more. I'm not going to do a whole study this morning on that. Uh, but I want you to look at the connection between being filled with the Spirit of God and not being filled with things that will take your ability to understand what's going on around you away. When you fill yourself with something that's numbing a pain, and listen, I'm thankful for medicine. I'm not, this is not, I'm not a, a Scientologist. I'm not saying don't take medicine. I didn't, I didn't say that, all right? But I'll tell you this. Our society is drugged up from top to bottom. And I tell you what, I, watch, I listen to people. I listen to what they say stresses them out. And you know what's, what's got people on the brink of, oh, 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 you know what's got them on the brink? Life. And I'm not trying to be mean to you this morning if that's you. I'm just telling you, that isn't how God designed this. And the way the world deals with it is they say, take this pill. Well, it doesn't fix anything. It just takes your ability to understand what's really going on around you away. And so, again, uh, there's, there's a, the, my point is this, and that's just one example. Go back to 1 Thessalonians, now that I've made a lot of friends this morning. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, my whole point is this. You don't want to quench the Spirit. You don't want to grieve the Spirit. So you know what that means? That, that means you want to be as clean a vessel as possible. You want to have your capacities about you. You want to be sober and be watchful and understand what's going on around you and yield to the Spirit of God's leading in your life. And so when you fill yourself with you and you fill yourself with the world and you fill yourself with what the world says resolves the problems and you, there's not enough room for And you go, God, how come you're not working in my life? Hey, give the Lord a break. He wants to. But as long as you're putting this stuff in and as long as you're blocking what he's trying to do, you know, what you're doing is you're quenching the spirit. Uh, I, was, I was listening to something the other day. I can't remember what it was. And someone was talking about uh, they felt like they couldn't breathe. I can't remember what I was listening to or something like that. I, I can't remember what it was. But maybe on the radio. Uh, maybe it was a, a sermon. I don't remember. But they were talking about being in a situation where it just felt like you couldn't breathe. Uh, I've heard people that say they have severe anxiety issues like that, and, that, and that's how they feel. Um, if you've ever dealt with that, I'm not throwing stones at you. I, I think it's a, it sounds like a terrible experience, to be honest. Um, you say, how does the Spirit of God feel in your life whenever you quench Him? Just like that. Just like that. So the, 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 the message in that verse is learn to give the Spirit of God room in your life to work. Now, uh, in light of that, I, I, have to, I have to segue. Sean knows exactly where I'm going with this, and so does Jose. Uh, these guys are troublemakers, man. They'll go, hey, pastor, what about this passage of Scripture, you know, right before I teach on something? Uh, go to Romans chapter 9. I, again, don't want to get too far off from our notes, and I, I, I made the commitment we're going to finish this this week, so I'm going to do my best I can. Uh, everyone's thinking, no, you're not, not at this rate. Uh, look at Romans 9, and uh, here's the idea. 
Will God overthrow your will to accomplish His desire? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, there's some people that believe that, that, for example, when it comes to salvation, you had no part in it. Now listen, let me say this right now. You can't work for your salvation. Amen? Amen. You can't earn your salvation. But the way that the Bible presents salvation by words like gift and as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, the idea is there's a part you have in that. And it's not a work. Your job is, Jesus did the work. Your part is to receive the gift of God, to accept Him as your Savior. There are some people that would go to the extreme to say, you have no choice in the matter. Way back in the beginning of, 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 before the beginning of time, in eternity past, God selected who would be saved, and God chose who would be lost, and they had no choice in the matter. And oftentimes they go to passages like Romans chapter 9 to try to prove it. I'm going to try to help you out with that. Uh, Romans chapter 9, not that you were asking for help with it, but... Here we go. Amen. <laughs> Romans chapter 9, look if you would at uh, uh, verse number 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, you know a person that comes from the ideology that I just described for you, you know how they read that verse? I'll save who I want to, and I'll damn who I want to. It's not what he says, all right? But well, we're going to explain this a little bit more. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, the context here is not so much a matter of individual salvation. As a matter of fact, if you go back to verse number 4, he's talking about Israelites. And chapter 10, look at verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. All right? They might come to, to a place where they accept their Messiah. All right? Uh, so this thing is not, a, uh, the context is not individual salvation to begin with. The, the point that God, the Lord's making this passage is God's going to have mercy on who's going to have mercy, and He's going to reject who's going to reject. The question is, why does God do that? Right. Now, I don't believe that you overthrow the sovereignty of God by man's free will. I think they can go together. Uh, let, me, let me show you what I mean by that. Look at uh, verse number 17. Here's the example that Paul uses. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, on whom he will he hardeneth. And do you guys remember what the Bible says about Pharaoh? Uh, what oftentimes people say is that, that God hardened his heart, and the Lord did that. But I want to show you something first. Look at uh, Exodus chapter number, go back to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus 5. God does harden Pharaoh's heart. The question is, which came first, the chicken or the egg, Right? And so the, the question is, is why does God do that? Well, because of His sovereignty. And be, listen, I, I believe this. God, through His foreknowledge. You say, what is foreknowledge? You're not going to beat God at chess. He always knows the next move, and God knows what's going to happen before it happens. The, the question is, is that, does that mean that God makes it happen? Parents, let me ask you a question. You ever watch your kids do something really dumb? <laughs> right. Amen. You're laughing right now. And you could tell them, hey, don't do that. And you can watch from a distance. They're going to do it, and you know exactly how it's going to end. Did you make it happen? No, you didn't. But through your foreknowledge, all right, through your experience, through your foreknowledge, you know exactly how that thing's going to end. All right, look at Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5, and look at verse uh, number 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. Look at verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Now, here's what's really interesting. Um, if you track this thing, we're not going to read all of it, uh, but do you know when God hardens Pharaoh's heart? Look at chapter 7 and look, if you would, at verse number 10. So you know what the Lord does? He, he, he sends his messengers to Pharaoh. You know what Pharaoh's response is? I don't even know who your God is. And God says, oh, okay. All right. Uh, uh, and look at chapter 7, look at verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men, the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. That's why, by the way, when someone says, I saw this miraculous sign, I go, okay, well, does it line up with Scripture? Well, I don't know if it does or not. Okay, well, the, sa the devil has power too. All right? But notice something here. They cast down their rods. They become serpents. Now, let me ask you a question. When, when God sends Moses to Pharaoh, has God hardened Pharaoh's heart yet? Nope. 
When God brings Moses to bring this miraculous sign, has he hardened his heart yet? No. Nope. But look at chapter 7, and look at verse 13. After this thing, you know what God does? He hardened his heart. But let me ask you, which came first? Now, you know what God knew? God knew this guy's proud. And this guy's so full of himself that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring stuff to him, but I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to give him a chance. You know what God does in tribulation? He gives Jezebel room to repent of her fornication, spiritually speaking, Revelation 17 and 18. Does she repent? No. Nope. But you know what God does? He gives them room. You say, why? Well, God's righteous. God's righteous. And he's not going to make somebody sin. Do you understand what it, what it, guys, what you do when you say that God makes somebody sin is to make God himself a sinner. God doesn't do that. Now, now let me show you something else. Look at Exodus chapter number 8. And look, if you would, at verse number 32. Read it. Who's hardening their heart now? Uh, look at chapter 9. Look at chapter 9. Look at verse number 34. Who's hardening their heart? Pharaoh. He's doing it himself. God does it there in chapter 7. I recognize that. But here's my point. There is still a man's will involved. And he's doing such a fine job of messing his own life up, God doesn't have to. And people oftentimes blame God for things, and the way out is to say, well, God just made it happen. God doesn't make everything happen. <laughs> and God's giving this guy room to repent. All right, look at, go back to chapter 8, look at verse 15. Chapter 8, look at verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not to them as the Lord had said. Now God's telling them what's going to happen before it happens. But God doesn't make it happen all along the way. God says, look, I'm going to let you, here, here, look, I'm going to put the chess pieces in your hand, your turn. Uh, here, I'm going to bounce pass it to you. Justin, where's Justin? Yeah, bounce pass, you like that? All right, all right, all right. And now the ball's in your court. You've got a choice in the matter. You've got an opportunity to do something with this. And you know what Pharaoh does? Pfft, who's your God? If your God's so great, why are you guys a bunch of slaves? I am Pharaoh. I am a God. And the Lord knows how to fix his wagon. Now, God definitely does hard his heart, but here's the point. Pharaoh does it first. And, and Pharaoh rejects what God gives him by way of truth. You can't overlook that. Guys, it's like this. It's like the people that overlook, for example, in James, when it says in the book of James that Abraham, our father, was justified by works. Romans says he was justified by faith, right? Now, over here, it says he was justified by works. Uh, but, but people forget so, or his faith was counted him for righteousness, is what it says there in Romans 4. And so what people forget is that whenever it talks, when Paul gives the example in Romans chapter 4 of Abraham's faith being counted for righteousness, that's Genesis chapter 15. He believed what God told him. God says, I count you righteous. His justification on the matter doesn't come for seven chapters later. You know what's different about your New Testament salvation? Your accounting for righteousness and your justification happened the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior. Now, do you understand what I'm getting at? People go to a place in the New Testament where, they, where Paul makes a reference to something, and they forget the history. They forget to go back and read the book. So in Exodus, what we learn from this is this, and I give you more I'm not going to right now, but the point is this, Pharaoh hardened his heart first. All right, and so uh, what I'm getting at is that God is not going to look at Acts chapter number seven. Acts chapter number seven. God is uh, the Lord is a gentleman. He's not going to force Himself on you, and He allows you to uh, to receive Him. Now, here's the point: by your own will, you cannot say, "God, I demand you have mercy on me." You can't do it. But there are conditions for God's mercy. I told you, uh, Acts 7, go to Exodus chapter 20. Go to Exodus 20. I'm sorry, I just thought of another place. You can keep your hand there in Acts 7. We'll come back to it. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And uh, look at verse number 5. This is where the Lord is giving the law to Moses. Look at verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Those are false gods nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation. What's the rest of that verse? Sounds like man's got a choice there. And God says, I'll visit the iniquity on them that hate me. 
Well, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, anybody ever hate God? And anybody in this room uh, come from a place where you got saved later in life, and there was maybe a time in your life where you had no, no desire for God, and you could say, I you know, maybe even hated God, and you got saved. Anybody like that? Anybody here? Okay, I got one. I got the couple. got a couple. All right. So you know what that shows you? That shows you you have a choice in the matter. All right. Uh, look at Acts chapter number 7. Acts chapter number 7. Acts chapter number 7. And I'm a real big believer in not just isolating a verse and taking it out of context. I like looking at the context, looking at where that thing is referenced later, uh, earlier or later in Scripture. Uh, look at Acts chapter number 7. And uh, look, if you would, at uh, verse number uh, verse 51. This is uh, Stephen preaching, and look what he says. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always, what's the next couple words? You know what that shows you? You've got a choice. Um, and the reason why you can know with confidence that that choice was not made for you is because there are those that resisted the Holy Ghost earlier and later on received Christ. Well, what does that tell you? When you try to build an entire system off of Romans chapter 9 that's not even talking about individual salvation as much as it is God having mercy and talking about the nation of Israel, that's how you see that thing in the beginning of the chapter, and in chapter 10, that's where it goes, all right, then you get yourself in a mess. And people try to build an entire system of teaching salvation based on that, all right? And my point in showing you all of that was this, quench not the Spirit. Say why, because you've got a choice in the matter. And you don't want to do that in your life. All right, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. I feel the heat right now. I feel the, can we finish this in time? I feel the pressure. We're going to move. All right. Uh, in your outline, in your outline, uh, just for sake of time, we're not going to look at all this. Uh, but it says the daily sanctification, number 61, that we're going to be looking at uh, there in verse number 23 where it says, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Uh, you say, what is that? That's a sanctification. Now, there's an eternal one that took place when you got saved. All right? That's a sanctification that refers to your soul. But notice here that you're a tri, tri-part being just like God. You're a spirit, a soul, and a body. And Paul's praying for them that they might be preserved blameless, and uh, we'll see some more comments on that. But uh, there, number 61 in your outline, it says this, the daily sanctification is explained in Romans chapter 12, where the process is mentioned as the renewing of your mind. You know what it says there in Romans 12? He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. All right, you're to be a transformer, not a conformer, right? All right, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you want to be clean, you want to stay clean from the, the junk and the filth of, of the world, and you're in a body of flesh, you, ha you should have that desire, it needs to start right here. And if you're pumping this with garbage from the television and from media and from everywhere else, you, you, you're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. Your mind needs to be renewed. Listen, I, I, I work a full-time job like most of you do, and I can tell you from being out there, there is something nice about getting around preaching. There is something nice about getting in your Bible in the morning first thing. It's a blessing to, after a day of work and hear stuff that you don't necessarily want to hear, and just, listen, I'm not talking that these are bad people. They're, they're decent people. It's not about good or bad. It's just the world. It's just the way that it is. And you've got to renew your mind because of that. And you need to do it daily. That's a daily thing. That is not a once-a-week thing. The Christian, listen, let me put it to you this way. The Christian that expects to have their mind renewed by showing up Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, and that's it, it ain't going to happen. It'll help you. It'll help you. And I'm glad that you're here. I, I, I really am. But it won't work the same way it would as if you would do it daily by getting in this book and letting the Lord speak to you. All right? So daily sanctification is connected with the renewing of your mind. All right, number 62, the Lord Jesus describes the process as being connected with the Word of God as found in John 17. Now, I'm not going to have you turn there, but in John 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. What does it say? Thy Word is truth. 
So, so again, you, if you want to be clean in your mind, you, you can't separate the, the, the effect the Bible's going to have in your life. Listen, let me say it like this. If you ate one time a year at Thanksgiving and you gorged yourself and you, and you tried not eating the rest of the year, you know what some Christians do? Well, I just got, I got, some, I got some good stuff in church and praise the Lord for that. What about Monday? What about t- Let me ask you a question. Is your flesh with you when you wake up on Monday morning? You better learn to beat that back. You see how you do it, the Bible. Amen. And let me say this, young people, that's not just for, every, for the older folks. I was going to say old people. I'm going to get you know, stoned at, you know. Uh, uh, young people, listen, I'm serious. That's for you. That's for you. That's for you, young people. It's not just for the adults. And let me say this. I'm convinced the more and more I spend time with younger people, the more and more I see what's going on in the world around me, it is a different day than it was when I was a kid in high school. And that wasn't that long ago. All right? But it's a different day. Man, they've got stuff. They're talking about stuff, and they're hearing stuff, and they're seeing stuff that we didn't deal with. And if you're older than me, you definitely didn't deal with. All right? You had your challenges. I'm not saying, listen, adolescence and teenage years, they're hard regardless. But, man, you throw all the junk and the filth that they're throwing at our kids today, you guys have no chance if you don't get in that book. Not a chance. You better get in it every single day. And that goes for everybody in this room. You need to be renewed in your mind, all right? Another word, number 63, associated with sanctification is separation. Separation. Pastor, I start talking about Jesus, my friends don't like me. Good. They weren't your friends then. You know, I start talking about Jesus and my family doesn't want me around anymore. That's all right. You know what? Jesus' family didn't always want him around either. You're in good company. All right? Separation is a good thing. You need to know, listen to me, it should be from things, no doubt, as well as unto something. Look at Romans chapter number 1. I've met some Christians, boy, they're separated. They're separated from everything. They're separated from the TV. They're separated from the phone. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not poking at you. That's you, praise God. That's fine. They're separated from everything. But then they forget somewhere along the way, what am I separating myself for? Well, I, you know, my, we have these standards. Great, praise God. Are you telling anybody about Jesus Christ? Listen, Paul was not separated from alcohol and separated from the clubs and separated from the nightlife and separated from cable TV and separated from Facebook. And separ- he wasn't separated from all that just so he could say, I'm cleaner than you are. Look at Romans chapter 1, look at verse 1. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto, not just from, separated unto the gospel of God. And, and, and listen, if you've got a thing, or this is my stick, or this is my thing, let it be the gospel of Jesus Christ, not your hobby horse. Um, and, and it's the, the whole point is this. If you're going to be separated from things, and you ought to be, hey, hey, listen, and, and whether you're, I don't care if you're homeschool, public school, kids, listen up. You're going to have pressure from people, and, and listen, the, the pressure doesn't stop when you get older. When you get older, it's just, it just changes the format. All right? When you get older, it's you got to drive this car, you got to have this job, you got to have this degree. It's, but there's always pressure from people. But you're going to have pressure from people to say certain things, to maybe dress a certain way, to have a certain attitude, to react to things the same way. It's almost like they want you to think it's cool to be unthankful. I mean, today's generation, I mean, it's like they're not thankful for, I'm not pointing at you guys, I mean, the generation as a whole, they're not thankful for anything. When I hear people at work talk about any kind of problem, you know, net neutrality. Oh, oh no, no, net neutrality. What's going to happen? Life's going to go on. You've got food in your stomach. You've got a car. You've got a house. You're good, man. You're better than like 70% of the world. What's wrong with you? Quit your belly aching. But they almost, I mean, you watch. You know, you get kids around and, and, and one-on-one, they'll be real thankful. Other kids come around, they're like, yeah, it's cool, you know. You say, why? Because there's that pressure. There's that pressure. Listen, be separate from that. Be different from that. Separate yourself from those things, but not simply, I'm separate from this, I'm separate from this, I'm separate from this. Why am I separating myself from all this stuff? When, when it, when, and I'm like, parents, I'm going to try to help you out a little bit. Uh, when, it, when, you, when you do that and you separate your children from these things, and I believe in it, let me tell you that right now, that's why my, listen, do what you want, parents, do whatever you want. I'm not telling you what to do with your kid. I'm just telling you what I'm doing, all right? The reason I don't want my kid to have a phone is the same reason I don't have him go walking around with a loaded gun. 
I mean, it makes me just go berserk when someone talks about gun control. And I'm going, yeah, and they're learning what in school? And they have what in their hands? And they can look at what in a matter of seconds? Are you out of your ever-loving mind? Listen, here's, here's my point. I believe in set, but if I just said, you can't do this, and you can't do this, you can't do this. Why? Because I said so, and it's good for you. How about because Jesus Christ wouldn't be honored by it? How about because, guys, listen, here's the deal. I'm not trying to be an old fuddy-duddy. I'm not trying to be ancient. I'm not trying to be old-fashioned fundamentalist. I'm trying to help you because I know this. In my own life, when I expose myself to all this garbage, it doesn't help me. I'm just thinking at your age, it's probably harder on you. How about that for an answer? It's not just a matter of separating from, I've, I've, I tell you what, I've seen both extremes. Uh, people who separate from nothing, they're a mess. And people who separate from everything, but they forget why they did it. And they're just as much a mess. And oftentimes, uh, they become a train wreck, or they go shipwrecked, or the kids do. Oftentimes, because they forget, guys, it's not about us. <laughs> It's not about us, and, and we're, we represent, you know, we represent the King James Bible movement. No, no, I represent Jesus Christ. And it's not about, uh, you know, the, the, oh, I represent my church. And I guess I understand I do that, but it's not about that. It's about I want to please the Lord, and I want to be an effective, I want to be an effective a vessel for His Word. I want the gospel of Jesus Christ to go out from my life. When people look at me, I don't want them just to think about my job or, or even just my family. I want them to look at me and think, Jesus Christ. You know what Paul is saying there in Romans chapter 1? I separated myself from a bunch of stuff, but there was a purpose for it. Sanctification is not just, I'm not, I'm not, I won't, I won't. It's, I won't because I want to. I won't because I will. You see what I'm saying? It gets lost sometimes. I think modern Christianity has gone to the place where they go, well, you know, what they do is they look at those people that have separated from everything and are ineffective with the gospel, and they go, you don't want to be like them, do you? Well, no. Well, then you don't need to separate from anything. Well, that's not the answer either. All right? Uh, go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You say, Pastor, you're passionate about that. I am. Man, you want, I, I tell you what, you, I've watched the waves and the fads and the things come and go uh, from friends that I have from when I was younger in, in church to, to, to pastors I know and seeing the changes. They, just, just watching the different fads and changes over the last 20 years in Bible-believing circles, and it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, you know, you just got to make sure you keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus Christ working your life so you can tell other people about him. So you can be a vessel. So you can be like Paul and say, Lord, I'm separated not just from everything. I'm separated unto something. The separation from these things has a purpose. It's so I can do what you've asked me to do. And so this morning, Christian, if you find that there's maybe a lack of ability to do what God's asked you to do, maybe consider, Lord, what are some things you want me just to, to move out of my life? Not so I can point out how good I am. Not so I can point out to everybody else, uh, look at me, I'm the example. But Lord, I just want to please you. I, I just want to do what you've asked me to do. Uh, look, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And uh, again here, I want you to notice doctrinally, uh, Paul references uh, in verse 23, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. Verse 23 in our chapter shows, number 64 in your outline, it shows the trinity of man which matches the account of creation. All right? Uh, let me give you this, and we'll go back to Genesis chapter 1. There's a discrepancy between chapter 1 and chapter 5 in regards to the image of God. Now, when I say discrepancy, I don't mean the Bible's mistaken. Please understand me. What I mean is that there's, something happens between chapter 1 and 5 that changes this thing about the image of God, all right, in man. This is why Jesus is called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because he is the image of God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. All right? Now, you can look up those references. The reason why I give these outlines all right, is so you can look these things up that we don't look at all together. Right? Go, go back to Genesis chapter number 1. Genesis chapter number 1. Genesis chapter 1, look at verse number 27. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 27. We'll go back to verse 26. God said... Let us. You say, who's that? God is definitely not talking to the angels, because man is not made in the image of the angels. All right? Let us uh, make man in our image after our likeness. That's God talking to God. All right? That's what we would call the Godhead, biblically. All right? We call that the Trinity. 
The Bible word is Godhead. We call it the Trinity. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. There's your hate speech. Created he. I can't believe the world's falling apart because the Trump administration. I don't want to get on politics, but, but it just, it's just common sense stuff. Right. I'm going to say this and take it or leave it. Trans is not a gender. All right, it's not. And now you say, well, I can't believe you said, guys, we are living in La La Land. It's like Alice in Wonderland stuff. You can't make this stuff up. You, I did not think when I was 15 we would ever argue about this stuff. Well, look, I, I feel like I'm a woman. I feel like I'm a cat. You know, what if I feel like I'm a broomstick? You know, don't call, I'm a broomstick. Well, how are you, to, who are you to judge? Do you understand where this is headed, guys? You've opened up Pandora's box. You know what God says emphatically? He doesn't argue about it. He doesn't take a lot of scripture about it. He just tells you, male and female created them. End of story. Let's move on. All right? Uh, look at chapter 5. Look at chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Genesis 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them. And if you go to school and people pressure you, you know what I can't stand? I can't stand hypocrisy. I can't stand the fact, listen, if someone came in here today and said, I think you're wrong, Pastor Adrian, and I don't think you should say that, I would say, okay, free country. I wouldn't say, shh, you have no place, you shut up, you, don't, you can't say anything. Do you know what they're doing to our kids in, sc- in public school? If they go out there and say anything like this, how dare you, they'll bully them. They'll bully them. They'll, I mean, you, uh, I'm going to go on, I'm going to get off of this. I mean, <laughs> talk about fascism, man. Genesis chapter 5, all right, look at, uh, notice though in verse number 1, when God makes man, he creates him in his likeness. Now look down at verse number 3. Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. All right, you see what happens between chapter 1 and chapter 5, the garden happens in chapter 3 and they sin. And the image of, of God, the perfect likeness of God, is lost because of sin in the nature of man. And the only way for man to get it back is through the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And, and so you say, why are we looking at all that? What's the point in all that? The point is this. The point is that's why you need to be saved. And when Paul talks about what he does, all right, go back there if you would. When Paul talks about what he does there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, um, Notice, it's really, a, what it is, it's a prayer. Go back there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and look at verse number 23. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He shows you um, that man is a fallen version of the image of God, but a fallen version. All right? And you need to get that straight. That's why a lot of people say, well, we're all the children of God. No, we're not. And let me go a step further. You are in one sense. This is why this stuff is so tricky. Uh, there are certain denominations, I would say certain cults, that say we're all the children of God. Anybody heard that before? Well, let me, let me tell you something. They're partially right. Here's where they're right. Physically speaking, you are a child of God. And you go, wait, what? In regards to the matter that you are a created being by God, I don't have time to go to it, but if you want to read Acts 17 later, that's what Paul says. Paul says you are the offspring of God when he talks to a bunch of Greeks, a bunch of Athenians who are lost, who didn't know God, and he quotes one of their Greek poets, and he says, your own poet said, we're the offspring of God. Let me talk to you about the unknown God that you're trying to ignorantly worship. But that's a reference to your creation. When it comes to your soul, when it comes to your spirit, your spirit is dead, according to Ephesians chapter 2. There's no death in God. Do you understand that, right? right? In Him is life. And so if there's something dead in you before salvation, that tells you that's not connected to God at all. You are not the child of God spiritually until you're born again. All right? You've got to get the image of God back uh, into you, and the only way to do that is through Jesus Christ. But notice that what Paul is doing, uh, number 65 in your outline, Paul mentions in this verse, what he mentions in this verse is a prayer to God on behalf of the Thessalonians. So what's he referring to? He's referring to the judgment seat of Christ that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, he'll do this over and over and over. Um, 
I think it was Wednesday night, we were looking at the subject of the judgment seat of Christ, and we looked at a place in Philippians where it talks about Onesiphorus. Does anybody remember that? And you know what he does? He prays to God on Onesiphorus' account that God will remember what Onesiphorus did for Paul in that day. What day is that? The judgment seat of Christ. And so uh, notice that what Paul is doing is he's praying for the Thessalonians, and he's praying that they might live a life that would be pleasing to God, uh, and so they would be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a connection there to two things. There's a connection to the rapture and, again, the judgment seat of Christ. All right? Uh, look at verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Well, what's the it? <laughs> verse 24 is another reminder of the doctrine, number 66 in your outline. Uh, verse 24 is another reminder of the doctrine of eternal security. You say, why? Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. What's the it? Preserving you blameless unto his coming. All of you. Now, how does that work? How does it work if my flesh is a mess and the things I would do, I don't do, and the things I shouldn't do, I do? And Romans chapter 7, right? The way that, that, that God fixes that thing is he goes, you know what? The first one is just, you know, it's no good. Let's give you a new one. Amen? So at the rapture, you get a new body. All right? Your soul, as, as the Bible describes for us in Genesis, I believe, 28, when it talks about Rachel dying, her soul was in departing. Your soul is going to go to heaven or hell. If you're saved, it goes up, goes to heaven. All right. Now, at the rapture, what happens is God fixes it so that every part of you completely is preserved blameless. You know how he has to do it? He has to give you a new one. He says, I'm not letting that physical one into heaven. There's too much on it. Amen. Uh, so, so that's what's going on there. Now, you talk about a great verse on eternal security. That's one that re very, very rarely gets mentioned. All right. Uh, but that's a good one. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. All right, verse 25, give you some practical stuff here, some practical stuff. All right, it says here, brethren, pray for us. Now, I've often believed this, I've heard this, and I believe it's true. You can oftentimes tell what's important to somebody by their parting words. This is some of the last stuff he says to the Thessalonians in this first letter. Now, we go, well, he writes a second one. Uh, do you know that Paul knows he's going to write a second one when he does? I don't know that he does. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, you, you read some of this stuff, and you go, well, he writes a second one. He doesn't always know that he's going to. The, the strongest argument you might make for Paul knowing he would write a second one, if God gives him time, is 2 Corinthians because of the mess that 1 Corinthians was. All right? Uh, that may be it. But in, in Thessalonians, I don't know that he knows he's going to write a second one. He does, but look what he says here. Brethren, pray for us. You know what that shows? In your outline, number 67, verse 25 shows the importance of prayer for the believer. I don't know what your prayer life's like, but man, I tell you what, you definitely need one. And for God to bless our church, and for God to put us in the right place, and for God to, to see to it that we, we're allowed to see souls saved here, and, and for the Lord to allow us to disciple people, and all the things that we want to see accomplished, you know what it takes? It takes God's people praying. Now, there's some of you today, that I've met some folks that are, that are aged, that don't have as much energy. They can't go out. They can't knock on doors. They can't uh, clean the church. They can't pick up a little one in the nursery. Now, let me say this. If you're not aged, you ought to be doing something. Amen? All right? Uh, but it, I've met people that say, I just have nothing to offer. You can pray. Amen. You can pray. And that's a ministry. I, I don't want to beat a dead horse. Some of you probably heard this a million times. I'll say it again. We have a, a dear sister in Christ who's no longer a member of our church because she moved away to Florida. But Rosa Escobedo prayed like I'd never... She would pray about stuff. She would, she would say... There would be times where she would just text me out of the blue and say, Pastor, I just want you to know I'm praying about this thing. And I just got done praying about it. That woman was close to God. And, and she... Listen, she... You could... You know, there may be some things she didn't understand... Uh, you know, language barrier here at church, maybe a lot of that. But I'll tell you this much. If I ever had a need, I, I still tell, hey, Miss Rosa, please pray for this. <laughs> say, why? Because she can get through, man. She can get through. I want people like that praying for me. I don't know about you. You know what Paul says? He says, brethren, pray for us. And verse 26 is every red-blooded American male's uh, favorite verse. When's the last time we executed that one? Amen. You know, you, you, I was in a church in uh, Germany where the men did it. It's, Europe, it's more of a European thing. It's more of a Mediterranean, European type thing. You don't see it a whole lot in the Western Hemisphere. 
All right? Uh, if, if a guy comes to church and you see another brother grab him and, mwah, mwah, you know, you're probably like, well, that's a little bit weird, a little bit too close to, uh, in contact for me. Uh, verse 26 in your outline, number 68, shows us that God allowed culture to influence the Bible. Now, for some of you that don't like what I just said, okay, then start kissing the guys. And I don't mean it's, it's not, in a, it's not in, a, in, a, in a lustful way. You understand that. The world would twist that and make it something it's not. It was a greeting. It was a way of saying, I accept you in the fellowship. Think about this, guys. What does Judas do when he finds Jesus in the garden? All right? Now, the, the, the point is this. Uh, don't, don't run with what I'm about to say in the wrong direction. There are some people that do. Let me give you an example. Where the Bible says, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. You know what some people say? Oh, that's just a cultural thing. Uh, no, that's a Bible thing. That's, that's all the way through. All right? Uh, but there are some things that you're going to notice like that in the Bible that aren't necessarily... I, I wouldn't say you'd be wrong for doing it today, but I'd also say this. If it tells you to greet one another with a, with a holy kiss, and you're not doing it, are you disobeying the Bible? See, see the thing you get into? There's some things that are cultural, all right, without taking away from doctrine. Some of you look at me like, oh, pastor's gone down a dark road. Well, think about it. When did the guys kiss each other? When's the last time, you know, hey, brother, mwah, mwah, all right? All right, you, you say, why we don't do that? Because cultures are different. You know what we would say? Extend the right hand of fellowship. I'm not advocating we start kissing either, amen? But I'm telling you, it wasn't wrong for them to do it either. Let me give you an example. Some of you may or may not agree with this. That's fine. Uh, you go to a church in Africa, and they start singing hymns that we sing. They'll take the same hymns, and they'll, you know, the ladies will be doing this, and there is nothing wrong with that. And I'm telling you, I mean, I mean, they're not singing with a drum set. They're not, they don't got an electric guitar. There's, not, there's nothing carnal about it. That's culture. That's culture. And, and let me say this. Uh, if you understand the culture you're dealing with, you'll be a better and more effective minister for Jesus Christ. There were things that we uh, experienced in South America that were different from our culture. They weren't necessarily wrong. They were just different. All right. Now, uh, let me give you this real quickly. There's a deeper reference to, uh, here, number 68. There's a deeper reference on the doctrinal side to an unholy kiss as found in Hosea 13, verse 2, where it talks about them kissing the calves or kissing the idols. All right? This is what Judas gives to the Lord in the garden when he's betrayed. Now, who wants to take some notes real quickly? I'm going to give it to you. All right, Mark of the Beast is referenced in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. Judas is connected with the Antichrist. The Antichrist blesses or kisses his followers with the mark. There have been times where my wife will give me a kiss, and it shows. You say, why? She's got that lipstick, and it's right there, you know. And, um, and you know what the Antichrist does? He puts a mark on those that he wants to bless. Mwah. That's what's going to happen. That's why the Bible talks about a holy kiss. You say, what was Judas's kiss? It was an unholy kiss. It was a kiss of betrayal. All right, kisses can be false. Gener uh, Genesis chapter 27, verse 26. All right, uh, the first uh, mention, I do want you to go there. Genesis chapter 27, real quickly. Genesis 27, this is the first mention of anyone uh, uh, being kissed in the Bible. Uh, Genesis chapter 27, and since we're on that subject, kids, no, you don't need to do it until later on in life, probably until you get married. It would be a good way to handle that thing, all right? Uh, Genesis 27, and that was for free. Genesis 27, and look at what uh, uh, Isaac does with Jacob. And his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. Now, you know what's interesting about that? It's a false kiss. You say, why? He's expecting it to be Esau, but it's really Jacob. You say, what is that? That's a good picture of something that's yet to come. You say, what is it? The mark of the beast. All right? There's a false kiss there. There's an unholy kiss, if you will. All right? That's the first mention in the Bible. All right? Psalm chapter 2, verse 12 uh, talks about uh, kiss the son, lest he be angry with you. You know what the context of that is? Jesus Christ, when he comes back in the second advent, after the Antichrist has been rule on, ruling on the earth, you know, he tells those who want to follow him, you better kiss, you better bow, you better kiss. You say, why? It's showing acceptance and adoration for somebody, is what it is. We would, in the church, say, extend the right hand of fellowship, right? Uh, but on the doctrinal side, there's something deeper there, all right? 1 Peter 5, verse 14 calls it a kiss of charity, a kiss of charity, all right? In your outline... Let's go back to the uh, First Thessalonians chapter five. We're going to close this out. Close it out real quickly. Look at uh, number seventy in your outline. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Notice the letter begins. Go back to uh, First Thessalonians chapter one. Look at verse one. First Thessalonians chapter one, verse one. 
after he says who's writing the letter and who he's writing to, the first word out of his, uh, out of his mouth when he writes them about, uh, what he's going to write them about is this, grace. Grace be unto you. You see, what is that? It's a reminder that the letter begins and ends with grace. All right, if you want this stuff, let me give it to you real quickly. The first mention in the Bible, the word grace, is Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, where God shows it to man. You're never going to find automatically man showing it to man or man showing it to God. It has to be shown to man first. You say, why? Because man is selfish. <laughs> so in Genesis 6, verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All right? Grace is found 92 times in Paul's writings. If you are not a, a staunch believer that Paul wrote Hebrews, I'll give you 85, all right? But if you believe he wrote Hebrews, it's 92 times in Paul's writings, all right? Uh, let me say this as we're closing out Ephesians 4.29. Your words should minister grace unto the hearers, all right? What, are your, what does your speech do for your family members? You know, I've, I've seen Christians do some really silly things. All right, someone, uh, I don't know, will say they uh, sing a special, and they couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. And, and someone after that special comes up to the song leader, the music minister, and says, why'd you have them sing? You know what my answer would be? You know what? I'm not going to tell you, but I'll tell you this much. I'm not going to have you sing. You say, why? Because, boy, your words can pierce and can hurt. You know what your words ought to do? It ought to build people up. It ought to minister grace unto the hearers. Your words should be seasoned, Colossians 3, 16 and 4, 6, seasoned with grace. All right? You ever had a, a meal and everything looks wonderful and you bite into that thing and you don't want to offend whoever made it, but you taste it and you go, man, it's missing something. And it might be salt. It might be some kind of seasoning. You know what that is? It's like your speech. As a Christian, you get around church people for a while, and you get in the Bible, and, and you'll learn how to say things the right way on the surface, but sometimes what's missing is a little bit of grace, a little bit of tact, all right? Uh, Hebrews 4.16, we'll close with that, Hebrews 4.16. See, Pastor, uh, you went a little long, yep, but we finished. I'm a pretty competitive guy. Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore, our first argument as a married couple was me cheating in Monopoly. You see, well, I just wanted to win. Uh, Hebrews 4, 16. You know, the Bible says confess your faults. That was mine right there, okay? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. You know, that's a place you ought to be familiar with. I call it the place of grace. And you know what? If you learn to spend time there, you'll, have, you'll extend it more to people than sometimes you do. The more time you spend at the throne of grace, the more grace you'll be able to dispense to other people. And so Paul closes his letter out to the Thessalonians with that thought. He closes it out with grace be unto you. And Christians, uh, I would say this. Let's all stand. We'll, we'll be dismissing a word of prayer. And we'll uh, take about a five-minute break. We'll start at 11.05. Musicians, be prepared. 11.05, all right? Uh, but I would, I would say this. I would say that whatever you do, all right, if you're going to give, give with grace. If you're going to preach, preach with grace. If you're going to witness, witness with grace. Uh, whatever you do, do it with grace. Do it with grace. All right, we're going to close in a word of prayer. Brother James, if you would, ask the Lord's blessing.